going cool. Yeah. Bobby, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. How you doing? Absolutely, Chris. I'm delighted to be here. So I guess we should just do this the old fashioned way. Is this that, you know, give you the uh the the regular question just so the audience kind of knows who you are and what we're going with and stuff, but uh just you know, tell us about yourself, the whole <laughs> traditional interview question, and then we'll just pick up things from there and uh we'll make it happen. All right. So yeah, my my name is Bobby and I have been an entrepreneur since 2000. And in that time, I I have coached more than 3000 people. I'm a, a podcaster, a, a speaker, an author and a coach in the area of self leadership. And really what I what I help people do is I help them take action in the face of a adversity, challenge or change. Because sometimes we can get really get stuck and it's like, how do I move forward? And that's what I love. Um, so that's me a little bit about me personally. Um, I have, as I was sharing with you, I've got three dogs. We live up in the Rocky Mountains at about 9,000 feet during the wintertime. I'm married to my best friend. And the rest of the year we spend in Northwest Arkansas because they have great road cycling there and great skiing out here. So it's perfect. Mm, nice. Yeah. Never yeah. Been, never been out that way, but I've always heard good things. It's a goal of mine to get out there. Yeah, it's beautiful. So you pay, became an entrepreneur in the year 2000, right? So 23 yep. years ago. Yeah. So let's go back this far. So what, what were you doing before that and why the change to go into being an entrepreneur, so to speak? Okay. So I had a lot of different jobs. Um, in, in my family, my family did not believe in college. And I actually had to fight with my mom to stay in high school. So college was like always off the table for me. Um, and so I took a lot of different jobs because I wanted to pay for my way to, you know, to go to college. Yeah. And, you know, once, so I did that, got my master's degree and everyone's like, who is this person? <laughs> like Nobody gets these degrees in our family. But so the job I had immediately prior to becoming an entrepreneur is I was working in a law firm in Chicago. It was a mid-sized law firm and I was doing all the training and development. And here's the funny thing. I started at the law firm because when I first started going to school, to college, I really thought I wanted to become an attorney. And so I thought, well, this would be great. I, I can work there. I was a legal assistant for a while. And I thought this is perfect because then I can work there and I can start to network. I can build my, you know, s some knowledge, some expertise. And it took me about a week or two to learn I don't want to be an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a great discovery. And then at a point, you know, I'd worked there for eight years. I loved the training. I loved the training, but I just wanted to branch out. And uh, I remember when I went, I went to the to 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 the head of the firm, and I said, "Hey, you know, Barry, um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be leaving because I want to start my own business." And he said, "You know, what, Bobby," he said, "Absolutely, it's the right it's the right move for you." And actually, then they became my first client because they needed more training done. And they're like, well, could we pay you as a consultant? I'm like, sure, that works. <laughs> of course. So yeah. going back again, why why was your family not about you know higher education and stuff? And did it make you feel kind of different knowing that, hey, I'm going to get my, like you just said, get my master's degree it's like who are you who does that you know and like they're even yeah. you know, to stay in high school i mean what was that about why, yeah why why that i'm not even really sure yeah. my parents it was it was more like in our family you knew that when you graduated from high school you were supposed to go out you get a job you start supporting yourself sure that was just kind of their belief and you know this was a, a while ago and i think that they just had this thought too that you know is it really necessary unless you're going to go on to something advanced, like, you know, a doctor or something like that. And so it was just kind of philosophically, they they just didn't believe in it. And I was the first in my immediate family to go. And, and it did make me kind of feel different because I was not following the traditional path of everybody else in my family. Yeah. And, uh, but I, you know, it all works out. It was important to me. So, so I did it. Yeah. Cause most of the time, especially in the area I grew up in, I mean, it was kind of instilled on you to go to college, you know? And yeah. No, and I don't know your age and how much difference we are, but I'm 36 and just that that was the thing, even not from family members or friends or whatever, but even teachers and guidance counselors was like, you know, I remember my junior and senior year, just, hey, what college are you going to? What do you got picked out? You need to have three and all that. And I was like, I don't know, man, like I, you know, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. <laughs> it was like, like, I guess I'm going. I mean, if that's what you want me to do, I guess that's what I'm doing. And that was kind of what was portrayed on me in order to be successful in life. You know, you go to college, right? Yep. Get your degree. No matter what it is, just do it. You, you get a degree. 
it was a little bit different because I, where I went to high school, was Southwest, Southwest Missouri. And I think that our, when I was a freshman, I want to say that we had 400 or so people in our class. And by the time that we were all seniors and graduating, I, and I might be off a little bit, but I think we we're down to like 260. Mm. Like, and it wasn't because people, I mean, a few people moved, but so many people in that area, you know, it's kind of a poor area. People had to leave. They had to go get jobs because they had to help support the rest of their family. Yeah. So it, it, uh, it, it wasn't as common then, you know, and, you know, but certainly a lot of my friends did. And, and that made me feel like, wait a minute, I was a good student. Why am I not going to college? And it just became this thing. Like, I want to go to college. I want to go to college. And for a long time, Chris, like, I was working two jobs and there was no way I was going to afford college with those two jobs. Of course. You know, so, yeah. but eventually, yeah. eventually it worked out. Yeah. So you went through college and everything and then the law firm. And then all of a sudden you're like, Hey, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start helping people. I want to start helping people get unstuck and start coaching and just, and I know you kind of had a little bit of a rough experience in your life at one point. Is this what, kind of sparked it all was like, Hey, if, you know, if I was able to get through this, maybe I can help others get through all this too. And then you can, obviously you can explain your situation more than I can, but we can go down that road. Yeah. So what I think what you're referring to is the illness, right? Right. Yeah. That actually happened in 2003. That was something that kind of solidified it, but as far as the coaching and, and here's the thing, I, I look at it more in terms of helping people develop in ways that are important to them. Mm. And that has been part of my career, no matter what I did. I, I've always had that aspect. And that really started, I believe, from probably two experiences in my childhood. The first thing is that when I was six years old, a speech pathologist, uh, he told my mom, he's like, she's never going to talk correctly. She has catastrophic speech problems. There's no hope that she's ever going to talk correctly. And when my mom heard that, She's like, you know, whatever, we're not going to listen to him because she said, you never let someone else tell you what you can or cannot do. Sure. And so I think that would experience was so important to me because it's not like she just said, hey, I believe in you. Right. She worked with me every single day. And that really showed me, like, even if you're struggling, if someone believes in you and, and they work with you, you can make progress. And then so growing up with speech problems and the speech pathologist was right. My speech uh, was really bad. And so when I was in the eighth grade, I decided I hated speaking in public. And I thought, well, I should take a speech class, you know, to learn how to speak in public because this is, it's a, you know, it's going to hold me back. Yeah. So I took a speech class when I was a freshman in high school. My teacher was Mr. Jordan. And as it turned out, he was also the coach for the speech and debate team. And our school had a good speech and debate team. And I gave my first speech. It was absolutely terrible. It was a complete train wreck. And, and and he said, and when the bell rang to dismiss class, he's like, Bobby, would you mind staying for a few extra minutes? And I thought, oh, my God, I've done so bad. He's going to tell me not to come back, you know. Sure. But instead, he said, he's like, have you ever thought about joining the speech and debate team? And I remember just looking at him and I said, "Um, were you in the room for that speech? Because it was bad. <laughs> you know. And he just smiled. He had this little grin. And he said, yeah, it really wasn't very good. But he said, you've got potential. And he said, with your potential and your work ethic and me as your coach, he said, you can compete and win in this area. And I think that experience there, because he worked with me so much over the, the, you know, the years I was in it. I think that experience there is what really solidified like just my love of, of helping people move beyond their present performance, because we mistake that all the time, right? Oh, my present performance, this is where I am. Sure. No, it doesn't have to be. And did you know, and I can, the reason I'm asking this is because I had some of the, I actually had the same problem growing up for myself. You know, they thought when I say they, I guess the educators at my element, elementary school thought I had speech problems as well, but they thought it was connected with my brother because he has cerebral palsy, but I'm wondering why. Yeah. yeah so why did they, did you know or think that you had speech problems or was, oh. were you aware of it? Or was it just something that was just like, why, why, why did they think? That? <laughs> it, it, it would have been impossible not to be aware of it. I mean, I, I think, I think at the time when I did the evaluation, there were something like 17 sounds I couldn't make. I had a tendency to slur all my words together. When I was nervous, I would stutter. Oh. Uh, so it was obvious. I mean, 
I was not allowed. It was so bad. When I was in, in grade school, you know, we always had to have those holiday plays. I don't know if your class had those. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and everybody had a had to have a part, you know. So I always got to be like the dancer or the angel. Um, and I even had one teacher one year. She said to me, "She's like Bobby, I have to find a way for you to participate in this thing, but you cannot open your mouth." I mean that. So everybody knew Chris. This was not. This was not a a secret that I had problems. Uh, and you just, but you just thought everything was normal, or you were? Did it kind of bother you, or what? I mean, did you just? You know. It didn't really bother me because this is so weird, but I just always had this thought that even though I'm struggling now for them to understand me, if I keep working at it, I'm going to get there. Nice. So it didn't, it didn't really, it didn't really bother me. You know, and I was a smart kid. I was very, I was very athletic, very competitive. And uh, it would make, it, it bothered me when like teachers made fun of me. Mm. That bothered me. Sure. Because <laughs> I'm like, that's just wrong. Yeah. But <laughs> you know, yeah. but no, I was like, you know, eventually I'll get there. Yeah. So, and in the, in the having that, knowing that you could eventually get there, that's kind of what started pushing you towards like coaching others and knowing like, again, like, Hey, if I can do this with the right mindset, obviously, and knowing that it yeah. might not happen tomorrow or the next week or next month, but it, like you just said, it eventually will get there. Based on eventually you'll get there, you know, and, and in some ways, you know, with the health crisis that you brought up earlier, the the experience I had with my speech problems, I think helped me when when I was facing that. Yeah. You know, because I, I shared this with you in one of our notes back and forth is that, you know, it was on March 6th of 2003, I collapsed. And by collapsed, I mean, I couldn't even brush my own teeth. Right. I mean, the, it, it utter collapse. It took uh, six months to find a doctor who thought that he knew what might be going on. And he's like, you know, based on the early research, he said, you know, People that have what you have, like only 3% of them experience a full recovery. Right. And, you know, and it was 18 months before we found a doctor who could help to, to treat it. It was a 10 year journey altogether. I mean, there was a lot of painstaking effort in there and just managing, like managing my mind, managing my expectations and, and, and what I allowed to come, the stories that I tell myself, you know, so it, it all kind of, it all kind of came together. So, so the viewers know just so they can get the background of it. I mean, what, I mean, why did you collapse? Do they know what happened? I mean, did you feel something going on leading up to it? Just give them the paint them the picture. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not trying to be flippant, but part of this was like stupidity on my part. Okay. <laughs> at some point in, uh, in 2002, it, what we've pieced together backwards is that I had mono, but I didn't know I had mono. I mean, I knew I was tired and in my, anyone who's ever had mono, you know, it's, it's, it, it kicks you, you know, it's hard. And, uh, but because I was a early entrepreneur, I was starting, you really starting, you know, I was networking, I was giving all these speeches, you know, doing all the stuff you're supposed to do for the business. I didn't listen to my body. So I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And when you do that, it affects your adrenal glands. Um, like I lost a third of my hair. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it was, it did not happen overnight. It was a good, probably nine to 10 months of the slow decline that if you woke up one day and you're like, oh my God, like this is happening, you would know something's wrong. But because it was a slow decline, I didn't yeah, notice yeah. it in time. I thought it was normal. I just regular. thought it was normal. Yeah. Yep. Get that. Yeah. You yeah. just wake up and you're not really noticing the changes till no. it's too late, I guess. Right. Till it's, yeah. Until you've really got a big problem until you can't brush your own teeth. Yeah. Like you, I couldn't raise my forearm to brush my own teeth. It was unreal. Wow. Yeah. It was completely unreal. Wow. So it finally happened. And that's when you just, and you put the collapse is what said, all right, we got to go get some help now. Yeah. We got to get, yeah. Finally, I realized I have a problem. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little slow to that party. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, the way it's not the way I'm thinking of it in my head is that, you know, when people, go into this negative loop of whatever it is and just, you know, a bad habits or, you know, eating poorly. And I just, you know, there's something that's out of the oh, order. Yeah. And then, you know, you don't really think of it just because, you know, you're having a shitty day or whatever it is, you're, you know, terrible job, family problems, you know, we all have problems, whatever it is, but you, uh, I guess looking at it this way, you know, you, you start to eat, go off track of your diet or whatever, then, you know, a couple of weeks, you don't really think of it. Then a month, you know, you just keep going down this road and all of a sudden it starts to hit you that my pants don't fit right anymore. And that's right. Yeah. And then some people kind of, <laughs> rather than doing something about it, 
they don't really seem to either just, well, whatever, I'll just, you know, my life sucks, whatever. It's a woe is me kind of thing. I'll just keep going down this road just because, you know, having a milkshake or binge watching Netflix or whatever makes you feel better. But they're not yeah. really noticing what's going on inside until hopefully if it's not too late. Yeah. You're, you're completely right. I think part of it, too, is we think, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. You know, well, being tired, it's part of life. Yeah. It is part of life. But if you're that, I mean, it's also uh, it's also a data point. Right. But we have to see those and we have we also have not only do we have to see it, we have to believe that we can do something about it. Mm. I think that's what I think. I think that trips up a lot of people right there. I agree. Um, yeah, because a lot of people don't think like you just said, like, oh, this is life now or it's uh you know, you know, I'm a big CrossFitter or whatever. And oh, I get yeah. told that, yeah, and I get told that, you know, hey, you're coming close to 40 now. You know, you can't do things like you used to. And I was like, man, you know, I don't know that's if that's BS. true. Or not. Yeah. And that's like, <laughs> like, I'm still doing pretty good, man. You know, and just, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're like, hey, you're going to wake up with aches in the morning and stuff. And I was like, well, I still I'm waking up pretty fine, man. I mean, I don't know what you're that's doing. That's right. But I feel good. That's and right. So, yeah, so I think it's these negative narratives. Is that the right word? That people are putting yeah. in their own head and just letting people tell them how they should feel rather than just saying like, wait, how do I actually really feel? Am I just feel bad? Cause they told me I need to feel bad. What is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I think too, it's like, well, you know, when you turn, yeah, when you turn 40, that's, oh yeah, you're going to start to feel this and that, whatever. So I'm now 57. And this year in road cycling, I had my single best time ever nice. and in, in cross country skiing, which is hard. I'm at 9,000 feet. I went out, I was skiing, Oh, this was so cool. I ran into, he used to train Olympic Nordic skiers and he's like, can I offer you some advice on your technique? I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not an idiot. Yes. <laughs> and, and so he's like, you know, if you changed your technique just a little bit, you know, it's going to, you're going to be more efficient and blah, blah, blah. So my second day out trying the new technique, I took eight minutes off my single best five mile time ever. Eight minutes. That's impressive. Eight minutes. That's huge, that, right? Yes. But 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 it's so but in the point about the narratives, um, yeah, we lock into these. Like, here's a simple example. I was um when I got sick, uh I, I lost most of my my strength and stamina, endurance, you know, whatever. And so part part of what happened is I have arthritis in my spine. Mm -hmm. And when I was really fit, it never bothered me because because I was very muscular. And then when I was, you know, lost some of my muscle tone, whatever, it, it kind of flared up. And one of the things that we did is we changed the way that we, that we, you know, would eat because yeah. at the time, like we were eating so many carbs, like over 400 grams of carbs a day. Like, cause I love bread, right? Love bread. Yeah. And my husband is doing all this research and he's like, Bobby he goes, I really think that this is part of what's causing your back pain. Cause this was when I was 50. It, the, my back pain was so bad. I could barely put my socks on in the morning. Like it was painful. And so he's like, you know, will you try this new diet? Will you try this new thing? I'm like, this is stupid. This is stupid. Because I didn't want to give up bread. I like bread. And he's like, will you just try it? I'm like, I'll try it for a month. Yeah. Chris, right. one week, my back pain was gone. One week, my back pain was gone. And over the course of that year, I dropped something like 30 to 40 pounds. I wasn't even trying to. All right. we did was cut out refined carbs. Right. And and it's like, okay. And then I remember I was sharing that story as at doing some workshop and it was on break. I was talking to someone and there was someone there and she's like, well, you know, my husband has a bad back. It must be way worse than yours because that would never work for him. And it occurred to me, it's like, that's part of the problem because we, you know, if we decide this is the way it is, mm -hmm. there's nothing I can do about it. We're not going to look for what we can do about it. No. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. There's tons of information out there. And like, we're, this is one of the mm -hmm. best times to be alive where we can literally sit anywhere you want to in the world and just look up anything you want to at any given time with a little right. device in your hand. And whether and whether it is like if you're stuck, like, hey, you know, why am I having this back pain or why does my foot hurt every day when I do this or whatever? You can actually start to look up and depending on your sources, hopefully you're looking up the right areas. You know, you get on the right. things. It's like, oh, you need to cut your foot off if you get on web. Don't start there. Oh, yeah, start, <laughs> hey, I have a headache and they're like, oh man, you only got three months to live. But it's like random. But if, is, what I'm saying though is it's like you can easily this, if you don't mind taking the time, like there's ways out of things to move, not move backwards, but move forwards. Right. And just like you That's said, right. even if you try something new, it's not a big deal. And I, and that's one of the biggest things with 
especially in today's age with nutrition, a lot of people are learning like, you know, it's, it's real trendy right now with certain diets and polar plunges and saunas right now, which I don't really, I think cause all the big podcasters and celebrities are talking about it, but there's also a lot of good science behind it about the benefits mm-hmm. to it based on what your goals are or whatever, whether it's nutrition, polar plunging, you know, doing cross country skiing or whatever, but there's ways around it is what I'm saying. It's, you're just not stuck. You're not stuck. You're completely right. And you know, when that, this is interesting because when that doctor said to me, he goes like, you know, the people who have what you have only 3% experience full recovery. One of the most common questions I get is people say, well, why didn't you get discouraged when you heard that 97% of the people wouldn't uh-huh. like, because I didn't hear that. I heard 3% would, right? And to me, that meant then someone knows the answer. You know, to your point that you said earlier, right? Someone knows the answer, either their doctors or the people who experienced it, right? So I just got to find those people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I eventually did. But it would have been so easy to say, I I, I didn't have the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, you know, when working with your clients, I mean, until they come, to reach out to you though, is, is that kind of what they've done? They're just giving up and just basically just like we've been saying like, Oh, well, this is my life now. This is how I'm going to live out the rest of my life. I'll just live with this pain or whatever. I don't want to stop X, Y, and Z. Whatever. What is it? Yeah. You know, it's kind of a combination and, and here's what's tricky about it. A lot of times those are the types of things that you don't even see. Like it's hard to hear the tape in your own head. Sure. You know, so like, when I'm talking to some of my clients, when I'm talking with clients, I'm listening very much, very hard to hear what are the stories that they're telling themselves. Mm. And, and like, here's some classic ones, right? I've never been, right? I've never been good at X, or I've always been this way. You know, th- those those are classic, um, or I'm just not, you know, so I'm always listening for those things, because that that's how you kind of raise awareness on, is this a true story? Like here's a, oh, here's a great example. I was coaching a sales manager once, I don't know, 10 years ago, something like that. And, and I actually thought this guy was a pretty good communicator. And he said to me, he's like, yeah, I've never been good at communication. And I was like, what? I said, why do you say that? (laughs) And he said, this guy was like in his early forties. And he said, well, when I was in high school, I had a teacher who told me that I wasn't very good at communication. I'm like, and you don't think you've learned anything (laughs) since high school? But he was holding on to that. Like, I'm not good at communication. I mean, we, we do this and, and it's like, it's it, it can be so hard to hear it for yourself. Because again, it's hard to hear your own tape. But there are ways that you can build your self-awareness at the same time. Mm, what are those? Really tuning into, like I, um, a lot of my content, I, I, I like to share what I, what I share with my clients, you know, because I think you don't always need a coach. You just need some help getting some awareness, you know, or building your awareness and not getting some, like you're going to go to the store and pick it up, you know, <laughs> but so building your awareness, <laughs> I want a jar of awareness, please. <laughs> but so like really tune into your internal dialogue. Like if you were to keep a journal in, in a journal, I don't care if it's paper or on your phone or whatever, but really tune into when you tell yourself, I can't do X or I'm not good at X or whatever those things might be, really start to pay attention to those and you will start to see themes. Mm-hmm. You know, another thing that you could do, um, get feedback from those around you, right? You can share with people, hey, I'm really, you know, like I'm building my awareness, you know, and, and ask them for, you know, what are the things that you hear me often say about myself? That's another big one, Is, you, you know, and then people, don't argue. You think people are afraid to hear those truths, though, that they reach out and they ask that, but like, you know, they want the, so for example, in college, we were, if it was like a health methods class we were doing, but anyway, you had to get up and teach a health lesson, right? And then your class had to give you feedback on how well you did, but the yeah. whole class, all they wanted to do was just give you the good stuff, right? Nobody wanted to be the bad person and say like, Hey, you know, you talk too much or, Hey, you, uh, you kept walking back and forth like a crazy person. Like, you know, yeah, like, <laughs> it didn't do well, but you know, everyone gave you the good points, but then it was like the professor finally was like, is anybody going to say anything bad or do I have to do it? And so is that what it mm-hmm. is that people, they want the feedback, but they don't want the bad feedback. Okay. So it's a great question. Um, and it's hard for other people to give us feedback sometimes. So one of the things you can do is if you think about your 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 network, if you will, support what your 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 people who support you, whatever, your your closest connections, those are often the ones 
who don't want to give you the the real and honest feedback. Uh, you know, they want to paint more of the rosy picture because they don't want to damage the relationship. And then you have a, a layer out from that inner uh, inner circle. These are people who are connected to you and they know you pretty well, but they're not your inner circle. And what, what researchers have found is many times that is the group that will give you real and honest feedback. You know, so 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 that's part of it, knowing who you're asking, because in your network, people serve different roles. Right. The other thing, and this comes from Marshall Goldsmith, who um, I love Marshall Goldsmith, you know, huge leadership, number one leadership coach in the world. Marshall's amazing. When he coaches executives, he he specifically says, don't ask for feedback because that's it's, it's kind of it has that negative connotation. What he says is ask people for feed forward. So the difference, the difference would be like, let's say you have a meeting sure. and after the meeting, you're like, okay, so tell me, what did I do wrong in this meeting? That's feedback. Right. Feed forward could be like, hey, we just concluded this meeting in a meeting similar to this in the future. What would be helpful to you? Uh, I see. Right. Different, so now yeah. it's not that, isn't that powerful? Yeah. It's a lot more powerful just because, yeah, like you just said, feedback versus feed forward. Now you can think about the future and not really focus on what you just did right there, but focus on, okay, this is how I can get better and change things. And, you know, now next time I'll get it better this time, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Focus on this rather than, yeah, I get 100%. It makes 100% that way. And just, and telling yourself that rather than just the feedback and kind of more judgmental type things, it kind of ruins you onto it. It's not really yeah. ruins you, but it kind of hurts you a little bit. And rather than just saying, yeah, hey, like we just said, like, yeah, moving forward here, I can get it better next time, you know, if I don't mind, you know, and it's one of those things that, you know, who who was it who said that every first draft is going to be trash no matter what? I think some famous author said this, or I'm hopefully I didn't make this up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I picked this up from somewhere, but my point is that it was like, yeah, so no matter what your first draft is, you know, it's all this thing, it's always going to be better on your next version. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But at That's least right. you started, at least you started. It's kind of the main thing. That is the main thing. Like, I remember, I don't know, that might have been Stephen King. That sounds like something he would have said. Um, but we're going to go with that. Because hey. <laughs> I know you didn't make it up. Be, be resilient I, yourselves when you get time. We'll look at a player. <laughs> yeah. I remember the way back, oh gosh, this was, this was, I don't know, long time ago. When I joined the National Speakers Association. And, 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 and someone said, and this was, like, I, this was like a legend in speaking. And he said, listen, your first hundred speeches, they're going to suck. Yeah. Your job is to get through those as fast as you can and learn from them. Exactly. And that's okay. But see, that's a mindset thing, right? That That's believing that we can get better. And, you know, and, and I know everyone's heard about the research from Carol Dweck, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. But when we have a fixed mindset, we think this, what I can do today is as good as I can do. Yeah. Right. And so then we have to be defensive. But if we have that growth mindset where we think, hey, I'm I'm learning, I'm progressing, I'm getting better. Then it's then we welcome that kind of feedback. And here's something I learned from my mom when I was uh, growing up with speech problems. There's tremendous power in a very simple short word, and the word is yet. And so how this came up for me is like I remember. Oh God, I could not say the word milk to save my life. Couldn't say that word. I, it was like it, just, it couldn't do it. And I remember one day I got so frustrated. And I'm like, I just can't say it. And mom's like, No, you can't say it yet. Ah, so it changes. Yeah, it changes it, right? Because yeah, it, it, right? Then it's like, well, if I keep practicing, if I keep working, and that's at the heart of the growth mindset. Now, my mom didn't know about that, but I was so lucky that that was her. That was kind of her her come from, you know. And so when we when we can do that for ourselves, it's powerful. Like if we're struggling to learn something new, that's okay. But I'm getting better. I just I just I haven't done it yet, and mm -hmm. it changes it. Because if we're if we're judging ourselves, we can't accept feedback. Okay. from others yeah that's one of the things that and i like to say on here and i feel because i feel this way that in the beginning growing up and even kind of through college that oh did i lose you oh you're back and kind of going through college that i had a fixed mindset and that oh yeah that i was one of these guys that you know if i just didn't know how to do it the first time or even knew the material on a test or whatever. It was just whatever. That's just me, whatever. I don't, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't doing, but really I wasn't even doing anything to try to make myself better as far as, you know, learning new material or, 
you know, I don't, I don't know, a good example is like an instrument, right? My buddy tried to teach me guitar, yeah. get the guitar and a couple of lessons. And I was like, I wasn't getting it. And I was just like, all right, moving on or whatever. But that was just because like, I blame it. It's more on me. Like I didn't care to try, you know, and it's probably easier just to say that it was their fault rather than my fault. But mm-hmm. and it wasn't until probably after college and started learning, I guess, different ways of what other people were doing with their life. It's like, oh, you know, I just didn't study enough. This was just on me because I didn't want to do it. I, yeah, I just didn't care. And so it was like, hey, you know, why, you know, let's learn about other things and, you know, you know, learn that it's just not one way of thinking on a particular subject. You know, like that's what I was saying kind of before the podcast starts. I go, that's why I like to talk in talking to a lot of different people so it keeps me less rigid more broad so to speak and i just don't stay in this one so to speak area that i can expand my horizons as cl- cliche as that's is saying that but yeah but that's i was true yeah i always didn't have like i like to say now i have that growth mindset but before yeah like and i think that kind of had gave me a bunch of limiting beliefs so to speak mm-hmm. yeah and just like this it's is way, like, like we were talking about earlier like this is my life this is how it's going to be I'll just go down this road until what anything that happens. But yeah. Yeah. That's just, I guess that's my point right there. That's right. It will, and what I love about that is it seems like he really used curiosity as a way to flip it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I've always been interested in things, but it was mm-hmm. just one of those things like, you know, talking about feedback and feed or forward and stuff that, you know, I didn't want to be that guy who was asking or seemed dumb or, you know, mm-hmm. reaching out for help, I guess. Into it. Right. Yeah. Or reaching out like, Hey, can you help me get, over this hill to get me to point A to point B to point C or whatever, just because, you know, I, I, and I, and I do still do battle with this on that. If I am asking for help, I'm being a burden on somebody. Oh, yeah. So it's more about being the burden. You don't want that. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, and it's like, well, I'll just not worry about it and just keep living my life. And that way I don't have to worry about this person helping me out. And then I don't have to seem weak, I guess, as a sense too. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's a big thing, though. Asking for help, a lot of people struggle with that. Yes, yeah. And wasn't until like I learned that, hey, it's okay to do that. You know, it's you know, don't go asking to something that's impossible or whatever. But it's okay to reach out and just, you know, be yourself and be vulnerable and just say, hey, you yep. know, and you know, you're not, you know, just like you're not asking for the world, so to speak. But it's like once I learned it was okay, I was like, okay, yeah. Maybe I start small. Like, let me start small. Let me go. And it, and that's what kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone, so to speak, too, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And anytime, yeah, the starting small is brilliant. Yeah. You know, and I had an epiphany. I don't know. I was in my 30s. And uh, it, it was fine because I, I was always one of those people. I always thought, I have to have the answer. I have to have the answer. I have to have the answer, you know. And then I thought, wait a minute. Do I have to have the answer or do I need to, do I need to know how to find mm. the answer? And that kind of released some of that like pressure of, because if you think you always have to have the answer, well, then it's, it's hard to be vulnerable. Sure. Right. And it's hard to ask people for help. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, And that was one of my things too, is that, you know, I don't know if that goes along with trust issues or what, but I was kind of like, I can do this by myself, no matter what it is. And just like we were saying earlier that, you know, especially in the time I was growing up in that I was, like, if I just didn't mind doing a couple of Google searches or whatever it was that I could find out the answers that I needed to, whether it be, you know, I don't know any problem in the world, really. Like, cause literally that's what you can do. If you want to go learn how you to play an instrument, go on YouTube. If you want to not go to the gym, but do a workout, go on YouTube. You'll find home workouts on YouTube. Like you can literally do anything you want to. And so that, I guess that's kind of what it was, was that, okay, I can go find the answer the way I need it to. And it might not be the right answer might not be, but it's getting me over the problem or it's fixing a problem for me temporarily. That's That's right. Yeah. And here's the thing. So many times we get hung up on, is it the right answer? And it's like, but if it moves you forward, even if it, you know, that is the right answer. If it moves you forward, I mean, if it it gets you closer to what ultimately is the right answer. So, yeah. Yeah, It's like taking the easy way out. I mean, there goes my dogs, but (laughs) it's like taking the easy way and you know, like le- looking for like, I don't know, what's a good example of saying this, but you, you got a problem and you just look for the easiest way to get by it. And then you move forward and you just move on rather than just, Hey, I got past it. Was, was this done correctly? Do I feel good or feel better how it was done? And can I live with myself or whatever? And that was part of the yeah. issues too, is that, yeah, like I was learning to get by at certain things. And this is like the me 10 years ago and 15 years ago, you know, like, still thinking I was, the catch pajamas, I guess, so to speak, coming out of college, <laughs> you know, being cool and all that. But 
<laughs> but like, I didn't realize that some of that stuff might catch up with me later on. Just that trying to avoid mm. these things like, Hey, you know, Ooh, maybe I should have done X, Y, and Z better that way. Now that I have this problem again, that I could, you know, resolve it faster and better and then wait you know, yeah. fix it permanently, not just temporarily. Yeah. Sounds like you do a lot of more self-reflection now. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's, and that, that's one thing too. I'm a, I'm to be honest. I mean, I'm alone a lot throughout my day. I mean, as far as my job, I mean, I'm basically by myself and then, you know, my going to the gym is kind of like my social interaction. So I have plenty of time to sit and like, that's what I do at work. You know what? I'm an IT guy. So I sit there on my computer, do my thing and put a podcast in and just listen to whatever they're talking about. Then sometimes stop it. Like, Hmm. Wait, they just said that they think, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, aliens exist or whatever. Well, let me, how do I feel? <laughs> like, how, how do I feel about that? Or, what, or when they go on these deep conversations about, you know, portraying who you really are and being vulnerable and showing that not everything is always unicorns and gummy bears and raindrops or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, wait, you know, let me think about that now. You know, and just, mm-hmm. you know, like a couple of examples, even with this podcast, you know, when things come up and just like me talking about it, like, hmm, maybe that's how I really feel about that. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. powerful though, isn't it? Very powerful. Cause, and even like, you know, doing a little bit of journaling that I do, it's like, Ooh, I'm mm-hmm. getting my thoughts out, not having to keep them inside. Yeah. You know, like I, I'm actually feeling like that's huge. Yeah. I'm not telling anybody, but I am telling somebody at the same time. Like I'm just not keeping it stored up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, stuff. that's one of the reasons that journaling is so amazing, especially because like if a person has anxiety or stress, part of part of what creates that and not the whole reason, but when we journal, we release some of it because then we can stop thinking about it. You know? Yeah. That's what I learned. And, and, yeah. I mean, it's it's so amazing. Yeah. And, and you know, and no matter what it is, I mean, good, bad or whatever, you're like you just said, like, that's one thing that I found out about it because, you know. A lot of people would talk about it, but I would just kind of, you know, well, you know, I guess that's just for if you're trying to get your thoughts out, if you're trying to write uh, a comedy thing or a story or whatever it is. But then it was just, hey, man, you know, it's actually, you know, it helps me be more. Dang- I want Jordan Peterson said this, that when you do write the journal and, you know, if, if a topic of like whatever, being vulnerable or, you know, getting out of your own way or whatever, you write it out and that way you get your thoughts out, then you can think about it a little bit more than that way when you're asked about it. You can actually yeah. articulate a little bit better than just saying that, yeah, just stop being stupid and do better, you know? Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but journaling is amazing that, you know, for that. The other thing I really want to comment on there, Chris, too, is when you were saying like you're listening to those podcasts mm-hmm. and then you stop, you pause it and you say, okay, how do I think about that? See, that is a key. That That's one of the keys to growth right there. Because we, this kind of connects to what we were saying earlier. We lock into our beliefs, the stories that we tell ourselves, and we lock into what we think we know. Yes. And we never revisit it. And that will keep us stuck. Yes. Right. I I was watching an episode of Shark Tank one time and Damon John said, it's what you think you know that will keep you stuck. And he's right. You know, so sometimes, I mean, I'm not talking values level, right? Our values are our values. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, even a nutrition, something as slow as that, you know, it's okay to revisit what you think, you know, especially as things change. And then talking about morals and values, though, that I've noticed, you know, like I told you, I'm not the same person 10 years ago, five years ago, 15 years, whatever. But I do notice that depending on how my life goes or whatever, some morals and values do change depending on the way that I start thinking differently about Mm -hmm. stuff and like noticing like, okay, this means more to me now rather than just how it was supposed to mean to me back in the days. Like, so for example, that, you know, I, 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 I'll say this on here, whatever. My, my family was kind of big on materialistic things, I guess was growing up and just that. And I kind of thought based on what my family was kind of portraying on me on certain things, like that's what made you who you are. It's like, you know, the, uh, you know, mm-hmm. what, you know, what the clothes you're wearing, the, you know, I don't know, this, your, the things you have, your asset assets, your what type of house you lived in, that's what's like that made you who you were or are. And then growing up, it came to me, it's like, it's not really that cool to me. You know, I don't really care if I, you know, have a, I don't know, a Louis Vuitton wallet or whatever. Like, I don't know if, you know, if that's cool, whatever, whatever <laughs> like, the thing of things are, like the highest end of things. And, and that's I'll, right. I like nice things, don't get me wrong, but I learned that 
you know, now, like I said, pushing 40, that it's more important to me that the time I'm spending with people and the things that I'm doing, because it's mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, and I heard a quote from, uh, man, he's a host of power athlete. I can't even think of his name now, John something, John Wellborn. And he said something that, hey, when I'm on my deathbed, I don't want to be sitting back saying like, damn, I wish I would have got that new iPhone, you know, yeah. years ago. He wants to be like, man, I, you know, I want everyone around me, like reflecting on the good times we had, you know, the places we visited, the conversations we mm-hmm. had, the food we ate, the drinks we drank and all that good stuff. It was like, man, that's so cool. Like that would mean yeah. a lot, you know? Yeah. And I think part of that, it, it is kind of natural that things shift a little bit. Um, Cause I know, you know, different things like, uh, different things will, will, I think, come into our lives at different times where it's like, yeah, that, that really is important. Um, and yet there are some things that I think are just so enduring to who we are. Like I've always been pretty independent. Um, I always loved helping people uh, like all the way back to the first grade, you know, some things I think really are enduring qualities. Um, but then sometimes our our priorities kind of shift a little bit and I think that's okay. Cause if we, if we've grown, then they shift. Yeah. It's a natural byproduct. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. If you've grown, so you're outgrowing what you originally thought or originally did and became hopefully a better person to a sense. And that, some people might argue with that because, you know, I mean, that seems to be the cool thing to do now is argue about any kind of topic that comes up based on the internet or whatever and just have what you, oh, you believe in A? Well, I believe in B. And it's just like, hey, let's fight. Yeah. This is well. Okay, and that's fine, but at the end of the day, though, I mean, as long as we're having a rational discussion, you know, we can talk about it and we can grow from each other, but as long as we're just not yelling at each other, right? You know, having these small, de- you know, like, I don't, you know, I don't mind a debate and or anything, but I was like, as long as it's done, what's the word am I looking for? Civilized? Like an, like an adult, you know, we don't have to scream at each other and try that's to be right. a powerful person in the room. It's just like, hey, hit me with some knowledge rather than just yell at me, right? That's right. Because it's not constructive. And yelling's not powerful. Yelling's loud, you know. Since you brought up the thing about debate, I have to share this. So I think that everyone should have this, like an experience like this. So when I was in debate, uh, I'll never forget this. One day, Mr. Jordan, he came to the classroom and he he said something like, oh, who believes in X, Y, Z? And it was something really controversial. I don't know, it was gun control, whatever it was. And so I raised my hand and uh, he goes, who has the opposite view? And Trey, one of one of my classmates, he raised his hand and we're like, yeah, you know, we jump up, we're ready to go. And Mr. Jordan's like, no, 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 not that easy. Because you have to take the opposite Ooh. position. Ooh. And we're like, no. And he's like, I'll give you 24 hours. But when you come to class tomorrow, be be prepared to debate the opposite position. So Trey and I, we stayed after school. And at this point, we were classmates. You know, we had each other in quite a few classes. And so we stayed after school. And I remember I sat down. I'm like, Trey you have to help me understand. Like, why do you believe what you believe? Like really help me understand. Yeah. And then we did that and, and we, you know, reversed and he did that for me. We went back, we had the debate the next day. We both said best debate we've ever had. Like we were just, it was so awesome, but it was such a powerful experience to sit down with someone who has the polar opposite view. And instead of trying to convince them to say, help me understand. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was so interesting, Chris, because you know, because we had strong opinions and we each like we could say, oh, yeah, I can see where you'd see that. Right. And then yeah. it was also interesting because we went from being classmates to being like best friends. Nice. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's I think powerful. if more people had that. Yeah, it's powerful. And that's like the thing is that, you know, pers- a person thinks the way just because of, you know, the way they grew up, their family, their history, just what was instilled on them or whatever, what they learned from a movie, a book, or whatever it is. And now I'm not saying they're right or wrong, but, you know, like you and I, we've had two completely different walks of life. And that's right. And because of technology and everything, this is what our past met up here tonight for this podcast were, but without it, it would have never happened. But still, I never know what's coming in on on the other end of this Zoom call, mm. so to speak. So I'm just <laughs> like, well, hopefully I'm hoping for the best, but what if you know, what if Bobby wants to come on here and just tell me that everybody should keep eating bread and only bread for the rest of the life? So I'm like, I going <laughs> to have a Zoom connection if that happens. Oh, I'm losing you. I'm losing you. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, it's just like, well, I got to understand. Like, I can't just say like, that's a stupid. I mean, I can say that. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. But it's obviously probably not socially accepted. So it's like, well, OK, let's maybe she's on to something. Let's see what she's got to say. You yeah. know, let's hear her out for at least a minute. But then. 
you know, if you're not hitting me with some good, you know, studies and well, I don't know, well-versed books or whatever, I'm just like, well, this is just your opinion. And that's not, could be a sign. Yeah. It's not really facts, you know, and it's not science, you know, mostly professionals in their field would probably say that you're wrong. And that's probably the side I'm going to take right there. But again, though, I would like to hear though. Okay. Well, she thinks this for a reason. Let's hear it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can always be curious about that. And that whole help me understand, man, that is a powerful thing. Exactly. It is. And it's maybe yeah. it's some people just want to be heard and just know. And it's like, OK, well, you know, like you just said earlier, like, I see why you said that based on, you know, yeah. this is just your life growing up. And this is what you thought you knew. Like, do you know, do you know who Michael Vick is? Yeah. So uh, going back a little bit, you know, he was the big quarterback here at Virginia Tech and. Oh, I forgot yeah. he was at Virginia Tech. I remember yeah. he was with the Eagles and then the yeah, Falcons, so, right? Yeah, that was his, yeah. So he went to college at Virginia Tech. But anyway, my point is, was that when he got in trouble with uh, the dog fighting stuff, I yeah. think one of his comments or rebuttals, or whatever you want to say, he was like, hey, well, I just thought this was life growing up. Like, this is just what we did. Mm-hmm. And and I'm not saying he's right or he's wrong, and I'm not favoring with him, but I was like, well, in some communities, that's what they do. They do. So mm-hmm. I can see that into a sense, but I'm not, again, I don't want to say, I mean, I don't believe in dog fighting by any means, but yeah, but I was just, right. I was like, well, I guess, you know, if you see that at a young age at four five, six, seven, you're going to think that this is just part of our culture. If that becomes your normal. Yeah. If, yeah. You know, you know, it, it's funny that you brought him up. I remember <clears throat> this was years ago. Back before iPads, I think I was traveling, flying through Indianapolis. And this was, uh, I think Tony Dungy was still the coach there. And uh, he, and I picked up a book called Uncommon and it was a book by Tony Dungy. And uh, he talked about when he met Michael Vick after Vick had been in prison, people criticized because, because Tony took him on like as a mentor and people criticized Tony and he's like, and they're like, why are you doing that? You know, this guy did such a bad thing. And Tony's like, Hey, I'm not defending what he did. I'm saying that. He wants a new start. Yeah. And I believe he's sincere. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, I hate dog fighting. Like, I mean, I've got dogs and I, I you know, oh, I know. You hurt my yeah. dog, you're gonna have to fight me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Do you think I know we're kind of getting short on time here, but do you think all people deserve second chances, you know, by doing a certain maybe is it depending <laughs> on what they've done or I guess or just general? That is a tough question. And exactly. Here, here's what exactly came to mind. I, okay, two things. I read an article, this was like in the 90s, and it was a woman who her child was abducted and killed by this man. And he wrote for, to her from prison to ask for forgiveness. And she's like, I don't know if I can or not. But she said, I agree to meet with you. And she she came to forgive him. Wow. And it blew me away, Chris, because I'm like, oh, my God, that would be like that would be one of those things where it's like, can't forgive you. Sure. The second thing that came to mind is on my podcast, Scarlett Lewis, she was one of the parents who lost one of her kids at Sandy Hook. Her her son was killed. Okay. And when she came on my podcast, she was talking about the shooter. And she was talking about how this this kid, the shooter, had been horribly bullied Uh, for his whole life. like, And she's like, it doesn't excuse anything that he did, but she goes, I can find compassion and love in my heart for him. And so both of those that when you asked me that question, it's like, those would be some of the hardest times, like things to forgive or move past. And, and, and I've always thought, man, I'd hope that I could find that kind of compassion, you know, because I think if someone's genuine, we've all made mistakes, man, not, not that big. Right. Oh, yeah. Not to that level. Um, but yeah, so that's what came to mind. I, I'd hope that I could find that kind of love and compassion in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I agree with you because I've never had to um, have to face a decision that big yet in my yeah. life. It's just that, you know, no matter what I say here tonight, I mean, when it actually truly happens, but I really think that, you know, in the event that it ever happened. And just, I wonder though, to myself, you know, some things, yeah, you can just be like, all right, whatever, let's move That's on. That's right. But, you know, if it's something really near and dear to you, just, you know, how, I mean, something with your example, like even me thinking right here, I, I don't know if I could ever. I don't ever, know. Yeah. It's tough. Yep. Would, it's would, really I would, tough. 
I want to be optimistic and hope that I, I could just trying to be a, you know, a good person, but I can't fully say that that's a hundred percent what would happen. Mm -mm. Here's something I, I learned and it's when we forget, because you always hear, oh, forgive and forget. And that's not, that's not, that's not the, the thing, right? <laughs> if you can forgive and you can also say, I'm not willing to be kicked again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if I forgive and, and you're willing to make a change, like, but if the person's just going to keep hurting you and hurting you and hurting you, I can say, I forgive you. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to put myself in harm's way again. So I don't think it's forgive and forget. But the thing that was really important to me, really powerful for me, the notion of you don't forgive someone for their sake. You forgive them for your sake. Because mm. if you're holding on to that anger, you're reliving it all the time, sure. right? They, they probably don't even think about it. You're not hurting them by not forgiving them. You're hurting yourself. And that was a really powerful shift for me um, when, when I, and I experienced it. I'm like, wow, that is really true. You forgive for you. You know, you don't even have to tell them that you forgive them. You can just say, I, I forgive you, but you have to mean it. And that can be tough. But that was that was a really powerful shift for me. It took me a long time to get there. <laughs> well, man, I think that's a good way to kind of take this podcast home on that. But real quick, I know we're getting short on time, but I've been trying this new thing where I ask you random questions out of this little cards that I have. And okay. I don't have to be long answers if you want. Don't just nice short little quick answers, but it's just kind of a way to help people kind of get to know who you are a little bit more. Basically. Okay, I'm okay. game. Okay, cool. All right. So first question coming out here. Let me shift or shuffle them. Here we go. All right. What is something that you would never buy online? A car. I don't know. 100%. That was my first thought. <laughs> like, I need the test drive, man. <laughs> no, that was, I've been looking at cars a lot lately. And I've, you know, some people go and just pull the trigger and buy one. I'm like, how do you know? No, I need the test drive. Did you, yeah. Did you ever test drive it? Do you know what, you know, did you look at this, if it's got scratches, what the interior is like? I'm yeah. Like, oh, does it make weird noise? But I know people who do it. I know. I found those people. It's like, people are braver than I am. But yeah. It's in favor of the bold. Is that what they're saying? So, all right. Well, <laughs> so two more here. Um, okay. Other than your nose, what should you never pick? Other than your nose? <laughs> I don't know. Um, poison ivy. That's a good one. <laughs> Scabs, but okay. Oh, that's a good one. That's that a good my, one. That was my first thought, just because I'm always, if I get one, just oh God, and I had chicken pox twice as a kid. I should have come up with that one. <laughs> I never got I never got chicken pox for whatever reason. Wow, you you probably had vaccines. I will, I don't know. That's a good thing. My brother got them and I never got it. So I wonder I got all right, that's something I'll ask mom after this. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I get chicken pox? I've been deprived. <laughs> All right, let's see. Last one. Um, oh, this would be a good one. Name two things society would be better off without. Without. Yes. That's reality TV shows where people are yelling and screaming at each other. Right. Nice. Um. Wow, what would be a second one? Okay, this can be unpopular. That's okay. Sometimes I think we'd be a little bit better off if we were not so tied to our phones. Ooh. And I say that because we miss that. We miss the opportunity to interact with, I agree. with other people, to get to connect with people, you know, face to face. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I, I think I think we've lost some of that. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. So I'm going to say make them go away completely. <laughs> yeah, go back to the flip phones where it's just texts and calls, right? That's yeah. Really, right? That's what one That's thing. That's right. Is, is that, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm probably addicted as much as anyone else, but it's just that, you know, do I really need to go look up and scroll through Instagram random? Like, like just when I'm bored, I just start doing it randomly. I, and I've caught myself mid conversations right. with people doing it, and I'm like, I am so sorry. Like, why did like it's just a bad habitual bad thing? Habit. Yes, and it's like, why did I do that? And yeah, 
And I, I, it finally occurred to me when somebody was like, oh, am I boring? Like, you don't want to talk? And I was like, I am an Ooh. asshole. I'm sorry. You are completely <laughs> There's some feed forward for you. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So let's take this home right there, Bobby. If uh, people want to find you, if you want to plug anything, all that good stuff, feel free to do that. Cool. Well, thanks for asking. Best way to connect with me, two ways, through my website, which is just bobbykaler.com. Um, also, I'm very, very active on LinkedIn. So I post content there four times a week. Um, and that's just Bobby Kaler as well. And on my website, I am offering, I just, I just created it. When people sign up for the newsletter, I have a free five-day email-based course on finding your forward, the fundamentals of finding your forward. Mm -hmm. And so that that would be best best way to get to know me and to, to connect. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks for being here. Um, any last messages you want to give out that we may not uh covered or you think you're good? I would say it, it kind of relates to what I just said there. And it's something I really believe there's always a way forward. So if someone is feeling stuck or challenged or like, man, I'm facing adversity, just know there's always a way forward. It's just, you just got to reach out to people and you got to find it, but there's always a way forward. Great. Cool. Well, thanks again. Appreciate you. Thank you. Here. This was a delight. Thank you. Yeah. All right, folks, we're going. See you. Finder, all that good stuff. We're out of here. <laughs>